Feminist Transformations of Moral Theory by Virginia Held. The Held article is a discussion of the ways in which feminist ideas have influenced our view of moral theorizing. So a feminist moral theory isn't a sort of distinct area like a Kantian theory or a utilitarian theory. Rather, what feminist moral theories do is attempt to include in our moral reasoning the position or the plight of women. So to call something feminist is not to say some definite, to be some definite description of a very specific um, theoretical approach. There are many different types of feminist approaches to ethics and moral theory. So there might be feminist contractarians, there are feminist rights theorists, feminist utilitarians. And what distinguishes a feminist from a non-feminist theorist is one that focuses mainly on the plight or situation of women. So to call something feminist in this way means that it is more an approach to ethics than an actual individual theory. Now, there are theories that some have termed feminist theories in which the sort of foundational part of that theory is based on the lived experience of women. So that will happen when we have so, uh, gynocentric feminism, um, certain care theories, although those aren't necessarily feminine or feminist theories. And there is a distinction also to be made between feminine and feminist theories, where feminine theories argue that there's a unique view that women have in virtue of being women, in virtue of actually being women that they have some view of morality that's different than men, as opposed to feminist theories, which simply want to look and say women and women's experiences ought to be included in moral theorizing. So what is the problem with traditional moral theories, or what's the problem just in general with our approach to morality. So one of the things that's problematic is the blindness to familial obligations. So when we start thinking about the way in which our society is structured and the assumptions that are made, these assumptions oftentimes leak into our moral theorizing and are also just our assessment of whether a society is morally better or worse. So, for example, when we look at someone, um, in a lot of cases at least, who's female, and we're talking about business or we're talking about the workspace, female normally includes this idea that either the woman is childless or there's daycare, right? So if you have someone working for you who's female, there's a certain assumption that if they're not, in fact, um, or if they do have children, that someone's taking care of, that they're going to daycare, or that they just simply don't have children. We think of male workers. Male workers are one either assumed to be childless or that child care is done by someone else. So although these trends, these things do seem to be changing, there still is this underlying assumption that when it comes to males, that they are not the one that's primarily responsible for child care. And this sort of blindness to familial obligations also ignores other types of family structures or familial structures. So we see this very 1950s looking family, right, with the father and the, the Thai is coming home and sitting with his children. And the mother's there waiting with dinner, been taking care of the kids, taking care of the house. Now, while this may be outdated, severely outdated at this point, we don't think quite in these terms, there's still these underlying assumptions, right, that there's more responsibility on females rather than males when it comes to children. And when it comes to child or the care of children, it's more often assumed that either both people are childless or that there's someone else doing the child care. Now, what's the reality of modern families? Well, modern families are, as you see here, just very diverse sorts of families, right? It's no longer male and female. It may be male and male, female and male. It might be split and extended families. It might be grandparents taking care of children. It might be a grandparent taking care of several grandchildren. You might be in mixed and blended families. So all of these things mean that the reality of families is not the simplistic view, the sort of 1950s, leave it to beaver, if anybody gets that reference, sort of view of what a family is like. So one of the things is that feminist ethicists attempt to do is to say, look, we have to look at the realities of modern life and not base our theories and our approaches on assumptions that are, that are woefully outdated. So just to give a few statistics about what's going on now. First, 54%, these are the most recent statistics that I could find, but 54% of households are now dual income households, right? 
Six, in 1960, there were 13 percent of households were single parent, whereas now in 2017, almost 35 percent are single parent households. So, so you can see these numbers have radically changed. So the assumption that someone who is male doesn't have children or doesn't isn't a single parent is mistaken just as much as someone who's female. The assumption is going to be that they're childless or have daycare. In fact, they might be a single parent. And these numbers now, at least over a third of households now are single parent households. And again, we can also look and say, what about the typical school day? So one of the assumptions we make or that we can look at when we're taking this from a feminist perspective is how has society structured its institutions around these sort of older assumptions? Right. So think about the, the typical school day. So I'm talking here about elementary school, middle school, high school day. What's a typical day for many? It's somewhere between 830 in the morning to three o'clock. So for some, I know in high school, you might get in at eight or 815. Um, at other times, it might be something like uh, leaving at 230 instead of three. But roughly, this is the normal school day. Well, now ask yourself, what's the typical work day? So typically a workday starts around 8.30, sometimes 9, although we see in a number of um, studies showing that people are actually going to work even earlier. So that even though work may not officially start until 8 or 9 o'clock, many times people are expected to be in by 8 or 8.30. Remember, that's expected to be at their desk at that point. So an 8.30 to 3 means that cuts right into the workday. So who's picking up the children? All right. So if you have child coming home, if you have someone who's a caregiver, You've already constructed a work schedule, which means that some people are going to have to somehow make arrangements around the schedule, right? The school day doesn't coincide with the work day, which then puts the onus on parents to try to figure out how to handle this. And traditionally, this was fine because if the woman was home taking care of the kids, then they would simply pick the kids up. But notice, no one considers when that's not the case, right? So now what happens when you have women who are working? How are they supposed to account for this? And are they forced into a situation of choosing between working and taking care of children? And again, we don't make that same assumption with men either, right? So while we say the women has to choose, why not men choosing, right? Well, oh, they've got their career to worry about. Well, why not women? So again, the structures, if we think about it, sometimes things that look perfectly sort of innocuous or gender neutral, well, everyone goes to school around these same times, yes, but not everyone can handle the responsibilities, familial responsibilities, when you have an institution that's structured in this way, or when you don't have access to daycare or support so that you can continue to work or not be docked at work for having to leave to go pick up the child or to lose a substantial amount of your income to child care expenses. So we also have one of the other sort of a, in, or one of the other critiques of traditional theories is the maleness of traditional approaches to ethics. So talk a little, I'm going to talk a little bit about this male, what are this maleness? What are these traditional ethics? Why are they problematic? What do they miss? So if we talk about traditional approaches, we talk about things like virtue ethics, Kantian ethics, utilitarianism, and what they all have in common is this emphasis on reason. So virtue ethics, even though they're multiple virtues, notice that on the sort of Aristotelian account, what happens? Well, we're supposed to apply reason, right? Find the mean between the extremes sort of idea. With Kantian ethics, right? Kant himself is completely sort of um, captive to the idea of the rational individual, right? The reasonable rational individual as a source of all value. So if you're less than rational, you lack certain sorts of value. So for Kantian ethics, this is fundamental. And the same with utilitarianism, right? We're making utility calculations based on outcomes that we somehow quantify. Again, a very rational approach. What's the right thing to do has nothing to do with who we care about. It, what really matters is um, what, what um, actions will maximize overall utility, right? And the Kantian's the same way, right? If I do something out of sympathy or empathy for someone, I'm actually not doing it for the morally right reason, right? Sympathy, empathy, love, those things don't factor into my moral obligations. And virtue ethics might allow for more of that, might allow for certain characteristics, but even there, there seems to be an underlying rationality that, that sort of takes over any sort of emotional response, right? I'm supposed to do the virtuous thing, and the virtuous thing is going to be determined by reason, 
not by emotion. So this sort of this sort of tension between reason and emotion, what many feminist ethicists say is that no, emotion should play a role in our moral theorizing, right? That we should talk about both reason and emotion. So the fact that it's feminist um, and the fact that traditionally it's been males doing um, ethics and it's been male approaches to ethics that are extremely rational sort of approaches, you know, very emotionless approaches, means that feminists argue, feminist ethicists argue that emotion should play a role, right? So philosophy requires the development of moral emotions, says a feminist ethicist, right? Emotions should be respected in gaining some moral understanding. So this is not to say that we replace um, morality with simply emotional responses, but it's also to say that emotions matter in our moral reasoning, in our moral understanding, right? So it's in one sense, it's we'd almost be monsters if we didn't take this into account, right? It's one would think that if I have a choice between saving my child and another child, you know, and I can only save one, it would seem almost, you know, almost monstrous if I would say, oh, I'm going to allow my child to die. Or I would say that, no, we could assume that you would go after your child first, right? That might be because we have a connection. We have this sort of emotional attachment to the to children, or if it was a stranger, right? Some stranger's child, not even a friend. It was just that I have a choice between saving my child and the stranger's child. It would seem odd if emotions didn't play into that moral reasoning. So what fem feminist ethicists want to do is bring into this discussion the role that emotions may or may not play. This is not to say that they take over. It's just to say that they ought to be included in moral deliberations, which they have not been done in the past. The other important sort of distinction that's made is the public-private distinction um, that we see in feminist ethics, and the this whole idea of the public is or the public is private, the private is public, is something that was brought to philosophy from feminist thinkers. So, when we say the private is public, and the public affects the private, what we're saying is exactly the things that I mentioned before about the nature of social institutions. So if you set a school day that cuts immediately into the work day, or you have business practices that don't allow for exceptions for those who need times, for example, flex time in the day to take care of children or pick them up or get them to where they need to go to daycare or other providers, then what the public does, what our public policies and institutions do have an effect on private life. Right? They have an effect on who is able to succeed. And this affects men just as much as it can affect women. Right? It might force us into certain roles that we would not otherwise want. Right? And the, the public, while the public affects the private, the private affects the public. Right? What happens in private oftentimes has consequences outside of that. Right? So in the past, we viewed the family so, as sort of sacrosanct shouldn't be intervening or there should be minimal intervention in the family, but it's also within the family where a lot of abuse takes place, right? And that abuse can then trickle on into um, the bigger part of society by putting out people who are not well suited to live with others, right? Abusers tend to become abusers. These has, this has repercussions for society. Also, when the private is kept private, it means that people who could have contributed to the public are kept from doing so when you have traditional quote unquote roles that we are losing resources we're losing ideas and a valuable individuals that could affect the public good but these things go back and forth there's no there's no such thing as a purely private setting or a purely public setting because each of these are going to to sort of feed on and have an effect on each other so we need to rethink the way we characterize these sort of social relationships right just because something is supposedly private doesn't mean it has it doesn't have public implications just because something's public and this is public political big institutional doesn't mean it's not going to affect private interpersonal relationships and these may be opportunities education health care um, it may be how individuals are viewed what roles are, are deemed acceptable or unacceptable so we can't make this nice clean distinction that people in the past have believed we could the, the notion of private the, the public and the private the next sort of idea is the concept of self, and this one I uh, may have alluded to in the past, but what feminist ethicists have brought sort of the table is our notion of the self. So if you look at traditional theories, 
um, particularly at the sort of male dominated theories we've mentioned before, um, we are not, as many of those theories assume, at, at a, atomic individuals, right? So if you look at someone like Thomas Hobbes, Thomas Hobbes would say in his social contract theory that imagine we've all sprung up like mushrooms in the forest, all self-sufficient, fully formed and ready to go. And now let's talk about what kind of society we would create or what rules we'd agree to or what laws would, would govern our behavior. Now, that's great as a theoretical tool, right? You might say, well, I, I'm going to start with assuming we have fully rational individuals who have interests and so forth. But that's not actually how individuals develop. Right? We don't come from the woods like mushrooms. In fact, there is no I before we. So what feminist ethicists note, ethicists, sorry, note, is that when I talk about I, myself, as someone who has an identity, that identity forms in relation to others, right? Without those interpersonal relationships with others, I wouldn't have a conception of I. So if you look at young babies, they don't understand. If you think back to your earliest memories, your self-awareness, your ability to be an I, a person, comes from interactions with others, right? As you learn language, as you recognize there's a difference between you and people in the external world around you, that you recognize voices and others. You learn this notion of identity, right? That there is an I there. But it's not something you're born knowing or understanding, right? We come to an awareness. We come to self-awareness and consciousness. So if you think about it, it's essential that you're in those relationships. And we have, there are plenty of studies, examples of, you know, the sort of wild child of France idea, where there's someone who quite literally may have been raised by wolves, you know, wandered off as a, as a very young toddler and never achieved intellectually the ability to speak beyond something like a five-year-old level. So it spent years and years, it was discovered around 10 or 12 years old in the wild, and turns out hadn't had any human interaction and had a very limited notion of self. Very limited vocabulary, was unable to learn through the rest of the life because without those interactions with others, we don't have, we don't form this sort of identity. So this is what we would call like a, a relational conception of the self. Our concept of self comes from our interactions with others, from our relationships with others. And you can't ignore that in moral theory. You can't ignore the importance of that. So if we want to be honest about our morality, honest about how things actually work, then we have to be aware that we are not self-sufficient, fully autonomous individuals like a Thomas Hobbes would say. Right? These relationships are important. And in fact, you wouldn't be you, wouldn't be here if someone else hadn't taken an interest in you, cared about you, cared for you, raised you, and so forth. So that's got to be morally relevant. Right? If nothing else, when we look at sort of political social and political ideas, that the idea that, oh, we are all fully self-sufficient, autonomous individuals who have a right to do whatever we want, and we don't, we've never taken anything from anyone, and you, you hear this all the time, right? That, oh, you pull yourself up by your bootstraps. But that presupposes that no one else has done anything for you, right? And the minute you say, you pull yourself up by your bootstraps, I don't know who uses bootstraps anymore, but that expression, right, you do it yourself, that assumption is that somehow you didn't get a leg up from anyone, that no one helped you, gave you a break, provided you with resources that allowed you to achieve certain things, right? And when we start to realize that, what we realize is this rational, autonomous individual that we see in traditional ethics just doesn't exist. And so now the question is, how much should that matter? How much can I attribute to the resources and the caring and the things that have come before from other people that have contributed to the, the me or the I here? And how much of it is choice and the the choices that i've made the effort and someone else right now those are legitimate questions but note that what the feminist ethicists have done is bring these sort of ideas to the forefront right say that you've ignored these in the past and now theories male dominate theories you need to take account of these and it's been you know, a valuable source of criticism for traditional theory. So it doesn't mean you have to give up on those theories, right? There are plenty of Kantian, Kantian feminist ethicists. There are plenty of rights, as I mentioned before, of rights-based rights -based feminist theorists. But what that means is that those engaging in those traditional theories need to revise them in a way that takes account for the experiences and the plight of women. So we need to examine the way in which society views relationships, 
how these relationships work in order to have moral theories that are more robust and that are and, and actually just more accurate to the actual state of human beings. So this is just a really broad overview and Held's article is a, a really nice way of showing all the different contributions that feminist ethicists have brought to moral theory and moral theorizing. And many of these things have been incorporated in contemporary um, theories and contemporary approaches. So when we talk about the children's rights movement that's happened, um, or at least the, the sort of children's rights emphasis that's been seen in political philosophy, social and political philosophy, say in the last 20 years, a lot of that came from these sorts of critiques, right? That we were ignoring the sort of non-rational or pre-rational young children. What rights do they have? What about their situation? What about the people who are taking care of these children, right? What about the roles that we tend, we tend to do associate with caregivers and what they're supposed to do or not supposed to do and who is a caregiver and whether the assumptions are female about caregivers, right? The caregivers are only female. So once you start incorporating the, these sort of ideas into traditional theories, you get more robust theories and, in fact, more accurate theories, more, those that accurately reflect what's going on in particular situations.